Welcome to today's Research Pays Off. I'm going to hand it over to our speakers. Uh, we've got a whole team of them here this morning. We've got Mike Lenote, Angela Farina, and Hader Ibrahim. Thanks, Louie. I guess I can take it over from here, right? Yes. Very good. So let me put the, the presentation here and share screen. Can you see the presentation? Yes. I guess now is in slideshow as well. Yes. Very That's good. Great. So uh, thanks, Lorin, for the uh, introduction and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, today we're uh, going to present some of the results we obtained in two different locations of the world, uh, here in Michigan and the, in the Emirates, um, by integrating the mechanistic empirical uh, payment design analysis in life cycle assessment framework uh, to um, evaluate the environmental performance of uh, different materials. And um, today I'm going to be um, to present this with uh, my colleague Angela Farina from Michigan State and uh, Haider Ibrahim, who is a PhD student at Khalifa University. I will introduce them uh, with some more details later on uh, in the in the presentation. Um, together with the integration of the MAPDG in life cycle assessment, we're going to talk a little bit also about the um, monetization on uh, environmental impacts for uh, cost benefits uh, evaluation. Uh, typically, um, when I discuss these topics with uh, some colleagues and with uh, uh, people from uh, governmental agencies in general, I typically uh, start the discussion with the question, how many times in the last 10 years uh, you um, met with somebody and this person introduced you to a new and other uh, green technology, sustainable technology for uh, pavements and uh, use of uh, this and that waste uh, in pavements uh, and in asphalt. Um, and uh, addressing that or addressing that uh, technology or the use of that material as green solution. And my answer typically to those people is, OK, uh, you have a new green solution. Show me that uh, that uh, solution is indeed a, uh, a green material for our infrastructure. And we can uh, put a dress of sustainable solution to, uh, to that material. Um, this presentation, I think uh, it's um, uh, well set on uh, timing because of four different uh, reasons. The first one is that there is a growing emphasis on sustainability, um, especially from uh, FHWA here in the US. Um, thinking about the sustainable payment program, the sustainable payment group that is handling the climate change uh, program. And they are pushing rightfully uh, state DOTs and other uh, agencies to explore the use of life cycle assessment and environmental products declarations uh, for uh, payment materials and design selection uh, to make uh, informed decisions on materials and design and of uh, hopefully in the future enhance the sustainability uh, practices uh, in the uh, pavement uh, engineering area. Uh, the second reason uh, because I, I see this presentation to be uh, uh, good in timing is that uh, we all know that there are some uh, global challenges uh, from the environmental point of view and we all have some responsibilities and we think as a research group at uh, Michigan State University that incorporating life cycle assessment into payment analysis should take to fulfill our responsibility to combat these global challenges. The third reason is that sustainability is always um, good to keep an eye on, but we still need to keep an eye on cost effectiveness and uh, risk mitigations of the solutions we propose. 
uh, and uh, we need to consider every stage of the life cycle of a pavement or a material so that decision makers can make informed choices and balance uh, economic efficiency on one side with environmental sustainability on the other. And the fourth reason uh, is that uh, regardless if one wants or not, uh, there are going to be soon some regulatory requirements that we need to uh, to comply and we need to, um, uh, to follow. I'm thinking about uh, environmental product declaration or some of the uh, ISO standards that we need to follow. And um, also the ASCE uh, recently published the uh, standard practices for uh, sustainability infrastructure. So everything basically is pushing us in uh, in this direction. But I think we need to be careful uh, on how we evaluate payment materials and what we do when we present the results of an environmental evaluation of these materials. And this is uh, this will be uh, basically the core of the discussion for uh, for today. Um, as I said, I'm here with um, uh, two other uh, colleagues. Uh, Angela Farina is a research associate uh, at Michigan State University, and she is our life cycle assessment specialist. And she's going to present the experience on MAPDG analysis in the LCA framework uh, at uh, Michigan State University. Then on the other side of the world, we have uh, Haider Ibrahim. Haider is a PhD candidate in uh, payment engineering at Khalifa University. Um, I was a faculty at Khalifa University until a year ago. Uh, she was admitted to work with me and we're still uh, working together, even though we are uh, quite far from each other, uh, but we'll manage that. Uh, and uh, finally, in the last part of the presentation, I'll be back. Uh, to uh, wrap up the presentation and uh, um, discuss some of the results that we obtain and uh, discuss some future research that we see um, uh, for uh, this, uh, this topic. Now, uh, if you look at this slide, you will notice that both in the MSU and the UAE experience, we are going to talk about rubberized asphalt. I just want to clarify that this presentation, although in the audience there might be somebody interested in rubberized asphalt, is not on rubberized asphalt. But both at MSU and in the UAE, our research groups uh, had good experience with rubberized asphalt. So we took advantage from that experience to um, dress the presentation around this material because it's often presented as a sustainable solution. But again, this presentation is not on rubberized asphalt. Uh, as I said, uh, rubberized asphalt is just an example that we are bringing to the table. Um, rubber is used, especially in the U.S., for different purposes. As only a, um, a small percentage is used in the asphalt payments uh, in different forms. Uh, here at MSU, we had over the years uh, different technologies tested. And as I said at the beginning, every time somebody approaches us, approached us, they approached us to picture the uh, material, the solution, as a green solution. And the question mark in this slide uh, is there just because, again, we need to understand whether the proposed technology is indeed a green technology or not. And what we include in the picture to analyze the environmental impacts of uh, these materials. Um, also, before I uh, leave the microphone to uh, and the screen to Angela, uh, I cannot pretend everybody is um, um, is aware of uh, what MAPDG is, the mechanistic empirical payment design. Um, just to uh, avoid any confusion on the uh, results that my colleagues are going to present later on, uh, the MAPDG is uh, 
a tool that was developed a few years ago, and many DOTs are now in different forms uh, trying to implement. Um, this tool replaced, at least for some of the DOTs, the Ashton 1993 payment design methodology. And um, with respect to the Ashton 1993 methodology, we are at a completely different level of analysis. Because in the MAPDG, we have three different uh, families, I would say, of inputs. Uh, on one side, we have um, uh, the uh, payment structure information, including the properties of the material, the viscoelastic properties of the material. Then on the other side, we are able to change the uh, climate and the climate stressors that are affecting the payment structure that we analyze. Uh, and we can include information such as temperatures and moisture. And then on the other side, we have the last family, which is traffic. And instead of counting traffic as uh, ESALs, equivalent standard uh, a single standard load, uh, we uh, treat traffic in its um, uh, in its all. So we uh, consider different types of tracks, different volumes, different axle load spectra, and all these information are um, uh, feed basically the mechanistic empirical models. I'm not going to go into the details of the empirical uh, mechanistic empirical models because there would be a, a presentation on its own, but the final result of the analysis is what you see here in the last part of this diagram is the distress prediction over time. So with this methodology, we are able, if the um, mechanistic empirical models are fed with the right food, and if the models are well calibrated to know uh, the evolution of the different distresses over time for that specific payment structure and that specific material. As I say, different DOTs are embracing the uh, MAPDG in different ways. Um, the uh, original MAPDG came together with the software called Ashtower Payment ME, developed by ARA. Uh, over the years, for example, uh, MinDOT is uh, developed the uh, payment uh, design and um, software, and that is um, a mechanistic empirical method and pay. Um, in California, for example, they use Kalimi, um, but generally speaking, for all of them, there is a level of uh, mechanistic analysis and empirical um, uh, analysis uh, in the tool and in the equations and uh, formulations that are included uh, in the um, in the software. Uh, for what concerns um, uh, the our experience, both in uh, in Michigan here and uh, at Khalifa University in the in the Emirates, we use the um, uh, software MIPA. Uh, MIPA is a mechanistic empirical asphalt payment analysis software developed here at the MSU, and uh, it's basically a, um, um, a, a uh, it implements the same models uh, of the original MAPDG with some adjustments. But the uh, the reason why we use this uh, software is that uh, it allowed us to play with the uh, climate uh, of of the UAE as well, while the Ashtower Payment to me is uh, a lot software and you can use only climate stations within the US and Canada. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'm gonna uh, pass the microphone and the, uh, the screen to Angela uh, to uh, talk about what she has done uh, at uh, MSU. Angela, floor to yours. Thank you, Mike. So thanks for the introduction and good morning, everyone. So I will share my screen. Okay. So 
The goal of this part of the research is to have a comprehensive evaluation of the use of scrap tires in asphalt application through the entire life cycle of the road pavements, starting from uh, the asphalt mix design uh, and the mechanical performance testing that were used as an input for the mechanistic empirical design in order to calculate the number of the reconstruction. And results of these two steps were used as an input in the life cycle assessment. For example, from the mixed design, the quantity, uh, the quantity of each material uh, was used in the material phase of the life cycle assessment, and the number of the reconstruction was used uh, in the reconstruction phase in order to calculate the environmental impact uh, of the road pavement. And in particular, I focus on the use of two crumb rubber technologies, the polymer coated rubber and the vulcanized rubber. The polymer coated rubber uh, is a rubber uh, with the uh, surface of the particles uh, covered by a polymer emulsion that can be SBS or SBR. Instead, uh, the vulcanized rubber is obtained by a chemical and mechanical process. The chemical process is necessary uh, to, uh, for the devulcanization of the rubber and the mechanical process to create the uh, pellets. In our lab at Michigan State, we design uh, five different mixtures. Uh, two of them were used as a reference, so the control, the unmodified mix, and the mix modified with the SPS. Then we have the PCR developed by dry technology, so in partial substitution of the aggregates, and the PCR developed by the wet technology, modified with a small amount of SPS as well, and sasobit, an additive for the uh, viscosity. And the DVR mix, uh, where the uh, bitumen was also a modified with the DVR and a small amount of SPS. All the mixtures uh, contain between 15 and 20% uh, of reclaimed asphalt payment. So after the mix design to determine the um, optimum percentage uh, of bitumen, I perform the uh, mechanical uh, testing in order to understand the behavior of the materials under different temperature and frequencies, the resistance again, the permanent deformation, fatigue cracking and thermal cracking. And all these results were used as an input in the uh, mechanistic empirical pavement analysis uh, as a uh, material properties. And as environmental effect, I use the uh, climate zone uh, for Michigan, so the wet freeze zone. And I consider two typical structures in Michigan, one for the low traffic level and one for the high traffic level. When we have uh, here the two layers of, um, of HMA as a surface layer and here uh, for the high traffic three, uh, three layers. So then the software uh, calculate the uh, material damage and the damage accumulation, uh, the distress prediction over time, and uh, based on this, I calculated the number of the reconstruction over the service life for these two uh, pavement structures. So in terms of results uh, for the permanent deformation, we can notice that uh, the uh, control SBS and DVR uh, mixtures perform better than uh, PCR dry and PCR wet. However, for the uh, fatigue cracking, uh, we can notice that the PCR dry perform um, as well uh, perform as well as the uh, SBS, and also uh, better than the SBS when we consider higher level of uh, micro strain. And in terms of uh, thermal cracking, uh, the mixtures containing scrap tires um, perform better than the references. Uh, for the mechanistic empirical analysis, uh, we found that uh, all the um, mixtures uh, show the failure for the higher eye uh, before any other uh, distress, uh, except for the uh, control mix that failed for fatigue cracking uh, first. So uh, the uh, number of the reconstruction um, were calculated based on these two parameters. For the life cycle assessment, uh, I consider one mile of single lane over 50 years as a functional unit, 
Yeah, I consider the material phase, construction, reconstruction, end of life, and all the input as a, a fuel, electricity, transportation needed to produce the raw materials and the uh, HMA production. For the construction and the reconstruction, um, I consider the fuel consumption for the uh, equipment used in the uh, construction site. And for the end of life, uh, the milling operation and the transportation of the wrap to the asphalt plant in order to calculate the global warming potential, so the carbon footprint uh, of the two pavement structures uh, for the high level and low level uh, in uh, traffic in Michigan. Um, in particular, for the crumb rubber, uh, I use three different uh, allocation methods because the scrap tires are a multi-output uh, system, um, meaning that the rubber is not the only output at the end of the recycling uh, process, but we also have steel and textile. So uh, in a life cycle assessment, to deal with this kind of uh, system, the allocation methods are used to assign uh, the right amount of uh, environmental impact to the product uh, under investigation, so in this case, the wrapper. Um, and this is pretty common uh, for many of um, recycled materials. Um, so uh, the first one, the, the first method is the cutoff method, where um, uh, I consider only the processes included in the system boundaries. So in this case, the transportation of the scrap tires for the collection, uh, the shredding phase, and the benefits coming from the recycling of the steel and uh, the use of textile as a, a the right fuel. Uh, the second method is the economic allocation, uh, where I use the price um, of the uh, scrap tires for each application, because um, the scrap tires can be used uh, as the right fuel or for other application, civil application. Um, a small amount of scrap tires is still disposed, you know, disposed of in landfill. So uh, I calculated the allocation factor um, for the production of crumb rubber, which was 0.88. This means that only 88% of the impact and the benefits uh, can be attributed to the uh, crumb rubber production. And the last method is the system expansion, <clears throat> where I expanded the uh, boundaries of the system to include also uh, the application uh, of the use of scrap tires as the right fuel in seven kilns. So if I cannot use uh, that portion of uh, scrap tires um, uh, to uh, generate energy, uh, I need to add in my system that portion of fossil fuel that will be used instead to produce energy. So I can avoid the incineration of the scrap tires, uh, but I need to add also uh, this portion of pet coke um, using the seven kings. So all these assumptions can show different uh, results in terms of uh, global warming potential uh, for the production of one ton of uh, crumb rubber. And uh, in the cutoff, using the cutoff method or the economic allocation, um, the uh, benefits of producing uh, crumb rubber uh, is more evident. Uh, and the system expansion instead, um, since we are still using the uh, petroleum coke, uh, the fossil fuel to generate um, energy, uh, the, uh, these benefits are uh, less evident. And also these results can be reflected on the uh, life cycle assessment results for one ton of asphalt mixture. Uh, so this graph is showing the global warming potential of the uh, credor to gate analysis for the asphalt mixtures. Uh, based on different allocation methods applied to the crumb rubber. And uh, the control is, so the unmodified uh, asphalt mixtures, uh, is the uh, mix with the lowest uh, global warming potential, and the SPS is the one with the highest carbon footprint, and uh, um, um, <clears throat> the asphalt mixtures with the scrap tiles are in between. Uh, however, when we 
include in, in the analysis also the performance uh, of each material, these results are the opposite because now uh, we can see how the control mix uh, is the one with the uh, highest impact compared to the modified asphalt mixtures, uh, both SBS or uh, scrap tires. And this is due to the number of the reconstruction uh, calculated based on the performance uh, of the materials. Uh, in this graph, we can see how the uh, use phase, so the, um, related to the performance, uh, is the uh, phase of life cycle assessment that contribute more to the total um, carbon footprint of the two um, uh, pavement structures. So, uh, to sum up this uh, part of the work, we can say that the recycled uh, rubber leads to a material saving over time because I calculated that we can save up uh, 58, uh, we can save to uh, up to 58% uh, um, of the material using the PCR dry and or the SPS in Michigan for a high traffic structure compared to the control mix. And this also leads to the uh, importance um, of having a local design, local calibration for the prediction model, and the importance to include the use phase uh, in the pavement LCA studies, as well as in the EPDs that should indicate the durability of the asphalt mixtures. So um, now uh, Haider will uh, talk about his experience in the UAE. So I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Dr. Angela, for your presentation. As Dr. Mike uh, earlier mentioned, uh, that we here in the UAE has been focused on the implementation of rubberized asphalt, and I will be talking about that further. But to start off, I want to give you a brief background about the, the United Arab Emirates, uh, starting with its geographical location. It's situated on the eastern side of the Arabian Peninsula and borders with Saudi Arabia, Oman, and the Persian Gulf. In terms Andrew, of size... Can you put the presentation on slide show, yes. please? Thank you. Yes. So as I was saying, in terms of size, it's roughly comparable to the state of Indiana. If we compare it to the state of Minnesota, it's twice as small the UAE is. The UAE is located in a hyperarid region characterized by extremely dry climate with minimum rainfall and very high temperatures. It makes the resource management and uh, developmental projects very challenging uh, while if you are keeping them environmentally friendly and, uh, and green. Since and this is a prerequisite here in the UAE, since the UAE has made climate commitments like and are signatory to the Paris Climate Accord, which led to their initiative called the UAE Net Zero 2050, which aims for the UAE to have uh, a carbon footprint of zero by 2050. Since we will be talking about rubberized asphalt here, I also want to give you some context into the waste type problem here. Annually, the Gulf produces 880,000 metric tons in this region, uh, and the UAE contributes uh, 220,000 metric tons of, uh, to the end of life tires annually, which is roughly 20% of the entire Gulf. And hence, the, the municipality here came up with the project of uh, rubberized asphalt. It's also important to mention here that the UAE produces around 4.6 million metric tons of HMA production, all from virgin material. So uh, substituting that for a sustainable alternative uh, might actually go uh, quite a long way. The, re, the, 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 the municipality, from the municipality point of view, they not only wanted to manage these end of life tires with this rubberized asphalt project, but uh, and uh, wanted to improve the pavement performance, but they also wanted to understand whether this uh, asphalt, rubberized asphalt is a sustainable alternative. And so they wanted to understand the life cycle assessment, and this was the perfect opportunity for them to understand that, uh, which is a life cycle which is catered to the local uh, context in the UAE. 
since we were responsible for this project and uh, we not only wanted to completely characterize the asphalt, but we also wanted to do a complete LCA, not only not limited to the product, the, the HMA production and construction, but we also wanted to incorporate the use phase impacts and, uh, and the end of life scenario. This was a, a unique challenge since uh, the use phase inclusion meant quantifying the MNR, uh, the, the MNR activities, which commonly relied on expert opinion, pre-established values, or secondary data. Luckily, we had experience at MSU regarding how to uh, incorporate the use phase and how to deal with waste materials in asphalt. And as Dr. Angela uh, conclusively suggested that the use phase impacts incorporation can completely alter the life cycle assessment results. So it was quite uh, important for us to, to, uh, to incorporate the use phase impacts here. So this shaped our objectives for the study. The first objective was exploring the potential of terminally blended rubberized bitumen technology as a better performing alternative to traditional paving material in the UAE. So why terminally blended? Why not the why not use the traditional rubber modified bitumen produced to the, through the typical wet process? Well, the reason for that was because the terminally blended, the TBRB from here on forth, uh, has exhibit low viscosity and very good storage stability owing to the fact that it's produced at a very high shear rate and at elevated temperatures. The figure below shows how the how this high shear rate and temperature affect the crumb rubber inside the bitumen. If we start on the left, it's just an image when the when the crumb rubber is in, uh, introduced to the bitumen. Once it's uh, settled there and it's uh, the, the, the crumb rubber because of its diffusive properties, it absorbs the light fractions from the bitumen and swells. And with further agitation, uh, they depolymerize and the long chains are broken. And then finally, we get a, 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 a crumb rubber uh, a modified bitumen with completely uh, uh, disintegrated uh, rubber inside of it. And this is what we call the terminal blend. On the other hand, the asphalts used here in the UAE are very peculiar and are characterized by its dense gradation and the low binder content uh, of around 4%, which is roughly, which is around 1.5% less than what Dr. Angela mentioned. And in order for us to introduce a new bitumen in these conditions without altering the the volumetrics or the the mixed designs we needed a smooth uniform binder and this was also one of the reason behind choosing the tbrb instead of the typical wet process modified rubberized uh, asphalt before our project, the UAE was moving from the HMA with neat bitumen to the HA high polymer to HMA with high polymer uh, modification of around 7% by weight of the base binder because of the fact uh, that the, the, here there are it's a hyper arid climate as I mentioned earlier and the, it's the conditions are challenging and. Uh, on top of that, the high volume heavy traffic loads are there. Basically, there are actually no upper limits on the 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 truck uh, uh, the truck weights here, so it's very challenging. And uh, so our objective was to uh, to analyze the uh, the asphalt with TRB and uh, TBRB and compare it with the typical HMA produced here with the uh, neat bitumen and polymer modified bitumen. And for that, we analyzed it in the lab for rutting and fatigue as Dr. the same way as Dr. Angela uh, described in her previous in the previous section. The second uh, objective was to evaluate the environmental benefits of the TBRB compared to traditional technologies uh, used in the UAE. And in order to do that, we needed to do a complete life cycle analysis, life cycle assessment analysis, starting with the binder production and the aggregate production. 
This was followed by the HMA production of the three different types of asphalt. And then we included the burdens from the AC layer, asphalt concrete layer construction. And then when the use phase impacts are incorporated, we uh, we evaluated the milling and the HMA replacement cycle. It's important to mention here that in the UAE, there is no recycling of uh, of asphalt so once they are uh, once they finish their service life there is no uh, uh, recycling facility for them and they are straight, sent straight to the landfill and hence there is no wrap also uh, let's now have a look at the the typical uh, cross section used in the UAE for the high uh, traffic volume uh, uh, for the high traffic volume uh, the asphalt concrete layer the unbound base layer and the subgrade are presented with the typical properties that uh, the volumetrics of the of the uh, three different HMAs under study here are also presented based on that we calculated the quantity of HMA in each lane per kilometer, which will be a very important input uh, to our LCA. At this point, I also wanted to reiterate the fact which, uh, what uh, Dr. Mike mentioned, that here we want to present a methodology uh, for, uh, 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 for this type of analysis. We, uh, we it just so happens that the rubberized asphalt is the case study here, but this uh, methodology can be expanded to any types of uh, alternative uh, sustainable material. Now that we have uh, discussed the uh, the pavement, the typical cross section of the pavements, the the different types of HMAs, let's so and the objectives. Let's focus on the scope of the LCA, starting with its methodology. We conducted the LCA according to ISO 14040 and 14044 standard guidelines, and we used the software called CIMA Pro 9.0 for the analysis. We used the impact assessment methodology of IPCC 2021, which focuses on the global warming potential as the key indicator for environmental impacts. Our focus was on the HMA layer, and the reason was uh, because the pavement foundation remained consistent across scenarios here. We uh, selected the functional unit as one kilometer lane with a, with a width of 3.5 meter and a fixed HMA layer thickness of 0.1 meter for a service life of 20 years. We use the cutoff methodology as explained earlier by Dr. Angela, and uh, the reason behind it is because it favors system using recycled material by excluding the impacts of virgin materials and uh, the co-functions. Now let's look at some of the results that we have, starting with the pavement service life evaluation. As I uh, mentioned earlier, the long-term performance was evaluated with the mechanistic empirical uh, approach, simulating the conditions here in the UAA, UAE. If we see here uh, the results on the left here on your screen, the DGTBRB has better resistance to cracking and rutting than the DG need bitumen, reducing the need for maintenance and repairs. DGPMB, however, performs better in terms of rutting resistance, but uh, shows inferior performance to fatigue cracking compared to DGTBRB. Here now the 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 governing failing criteria is the bottom of fatigue cracking, and uh, based on that, we, we evaluated our number of uh, reconstruction efforts. For the unmodified asphalt, the DG need bitumen, we needed four reconstructions while uh, what the service life of 20 years, while for the DG PMB, we needed one, and the DG TBRP didn't need any. If we look at the cradle to gate results, the DGTBRB shows 9 and 25% less environmental burden compared to the DG need bitumen and DGPMB respectively. The aggregate production and the aggregate transportation is almost uh, the same across scenarios, but you can see that the DGTBRB has lesser amount of burden for the aggregate production and transportation. It's due to the fact that uh, per kilometer, the DGTBRB, uh, based on the volumetrics, has around five tons less material uh, needed or the less five tons of uh, less material is needed in a, in a kilometer length of road. The main difference which is created here is by the bitumen production. 
And starting with the DGPMB, we can see that it's much, much higher compared to the DGTBRB especially. And that's owing to the fact that the, the, the SPS in the DGPMB is, uh, is imported all the way from Germany through Geneva to the UAE. Plus, there are added environmental burdens from the blending process of SPS with the base binder. Compared to that, the DGTBRB actually uh, had some uh, had crumb rubber, which was sourced from end of life tires, which were locally available, and it had no effective transportation. Plus. The steel production uh, was also placed as an avoided product, so that also lowered the environmental burdens. The asphalt mixing is uh, is lower for the DG need bitumen uh, because of the the lower mixing temperature, which was around uh, 155 compared to uh, DGPMB and DGTBRP, the modified ones, which were mixed at around 170 here. Now let's see what happens if we. Uh, incorporate the use phase and do a complete cradle to grave analysis. So what happens to the results? Well, hierarchy change complete, changes completely. And now the DGTBRB shows 83% less environmental burden compared to the NEAT bitumen and 63% less compared to the DGPMB. Starting with the HMA production here, as we, uh, this is the same as we discussed in the cradle to uh, gate approach, so it can be misleading. The HMA layer construction, uh, uh, this is uh, with the transportation of the HMA from the plant to the laying site, is almost similar across scenarios. The 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 laying uh, operations were different, of course, for the for the modified and the unmodified. But compared to transportation, their uh, their environmental burden was not that much, so it's not accurately reflected here. But uh, if you consider the whole HMA layer construction and transportation, it's mm, comparatively similar. The MNR activities now affect uh, the DG need bitumen the most with a very high environmental burden because of the four reconstruction cycles, which includes obviously the production, the milling, the the uh, and uh, the the laying of asphalt, and the DGPMB also has that, but only for one reconstruction cycle. And of course, then there is the added burden due to transportation to the landfill, which in the DG need bitumen uh, case is a lot more than the DGPMB and the DGTBRB since it's needed, uh, since it was not uh, milled and transported to the, the landfill facility in the service life. It's effectively zero. So now, these results, uh, they uh, very much complement what Dr. Angela just presented and uh, emphasize the, 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 the incorporation of the use phase in our LCA analysis. We presented these results to the, to the municipality and they received it very well. But uh, they still have a follow-up question, which was how can they integrate the LCA results into their cost-benefit analysis? And our answer to that was monetization of environmental impacts. Through monetization, we, we seek to attach a dollar value to the harm caused and avoided by emission, in, in our case, the greenhouse gases. But what's the significance? Why do we need it? Well, it helps us, under, uh, helps us understand the meaning behind emissions and allows for a clear understanding of the economic consequences be associated with these environmental impacts, essentially creating awareness. Simply put, it means putting a price tag on the harm caused or avoided to the environment. The question now is, how do you put the price tag on? Well, for that, we went back and we saw what are the UAE strategies and the climatic uh, the climatic promises that they have made and how much they have invested towards them. So the climatic promise was UAE net zero by 2050 uh, and they have invested around 40 billion uh, 40 billion US dollars uh, uh, for that and an and, and estimated total of 163 billion US dollars will be allocated to reach the net zero emission by the 20 by uh, 2050. Now, keeping this in mind, we have this information. We apply the method called distance to target approach uh, to monetize this, these environmental impacts. The distance to target approach is not the only one. 
there are a number of methods for monetization of the environmental impacts, including abatement cost or a uh, damage cost approach or the carbon tax method. So there are a few other approaches, but uh, it was uh, it worked well for us and we had the data uh, which was needed uh, to do the analysis for this method. So the approach evaluates the cost of reducing emission to meet a specific policy target. And you can find the GHG price by uh, dividing the total investment till date towards the, 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 the net zero target. Uh, by the by the difference of the overall CO2 equivalent emissions produced by UAE and the target emissions. And then you can find the monetized impacts by multiplying the GHG price that you just calculated, multiply with the, the greenhouse gases that your HMA is producing throughout its life cycle. And correspondingly, then you can uh, calculate the environmental saving between two alternative paving material if you select one over the other. So by plugging in the values, we got a GG price of 100 and uh, a GG price of 157 per dollars per metric ton of CO2 equivalent. And here in in the denominator, you can see a zero here. Well, the zero is because the target is zero emissions. So uh, by 2050, and that's why here uh, there is a zero. So it's 40 billion divided by uh, 254.62 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. That is the greenhouse gases produced by the UAE. If we uh, uh, now th this uh, image or this graph is a double X graph which shows the environmental savings not only in dollars per kilometer lane but also in dollars per metric ton of HMA. So uh, the green one shows the dollar per metric ton of HMA. And if you choose DGTBRB or the DG need bitumen, you will have a total environmental uh, saving, a dollar per metric ton uh, saving of around $53. If you prefer DGTBRB or the DGPMB, you can save up to around $18 per metric ton. And similarly, for if you prefer DGPMB or DG uh, need bitumen, you can save up to around $36. Now the blue bar shows the same, but in kilometer lane. For example, if you prefer DGTBRB or DG need bitumen, you can have environmental saving up to $47,000 per kilometer lane. To put it into context for you, for our audience here, I've also, uh, put the HMA prices in the UAE, which is 60, 73.5 and 67 for uh, HMA with bitumen, HMA with PMB and HMA with TBRB respectively. Uh, that's all from me. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like to uh, give the floor now to Dr. Mike to sum up uh, the remaining presentation. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Haider. Uh... I guess you can see my uh, screen now. Uh, so um, as uh, we can't see, can it you see my screen quite yet, not yet. Not yet. So let me reshare it. Can you see it go. now? Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, so, um, uh, as uh, Haider uh, said, uh, we had some uh, good overlap uh, between the finding uh, in two different uh, parts of the world. Uh, I would say that uh, the research we have done um, uh, actually paid off uh, both in, in Michigan and uh, in the UAE. In Michigan, uh, we hope that some of the results that we obtained and we show today will be used by uh, the local um, environmental agency to um, uh, to uh, showcase some of the results and um, to the uh, to the local department of transportation and uh, in the UAE we also uh, we are also still discussing um, the monetization of the environmental impacts and the local governmental agencies are pretty much interested in in that um, to summarize I uh, I think we can um, uh, we can um, you know divide the findings in four points the first 
one is a methodological contribution. As we said before, the discussion is not tied to rubberized asphalt. So we can use the MAPDG analysis in the life cycle assessment framework for basically every kind of technology, every kind of material that we are studying. I'm thinking, for example, about the reuse of plastic, waste plastics that now is uh, a very high topic. Uh, and um, the MAPDG analysis uh, provided in our uh, case um, uh, a, a good understanding of the of the use phase. And uh, what we want to stress here in this presentation is that uh, industrial byproducts uh, are not necessarily green solution for our infrastructures. Angela showed a couple of um, uh, rubberized technologies that were not good from a sustainable point of view, for example. So not every uh, green solution uh, that people try to sell are indeed green solution, especially when we consider the use phase of these materials. On the other side, however, uh, and this is uh, maybe the uh, most important uh, point for me of the discussion is that higher impact at the gate shall not penalize the materials in the selection or decision process. For example, if we compare an SBS modified an HMA with SBS modified bitumen versus an HMA with a NIT bitumen, of course the SBS modified asphalt will have higher impact at the gate. But uh, we are forgetting about the engineering purpose of that material and why we are adding SBS in the in the bitumen and in the asphalt. So um, not necessarily higher impacts at the gate shall um, uh, penalize the, the selection of the material. In terms of monetization and uh, savings, uh, we are discussing with the municipality in the UAE uh, how to use the monetize uh, and uh, the, the results of the monetization to apply discount rates for uh, green solutions. And we think that uh, even the, the numbers we show today are, um, uh, are, are um, significant, uh, have a certain significance, but we need to think about the road networks and on, not only a single project. And also, uh, we are still going to push in the direction of monetization because the life cycle assessment results are often perceived as intangible values. So when you talk to people and you say, I have 100 kilograms of CO2 equivalent, people do not often understand what this means. And the monetization of the environmental impact can help people digest the results of the, um, uh, of the LCA, or if you will, uh, use the same language. Um, and in this regard, uh, we uh, would like to also uh, put a little bit on em an emphasis on the environmental product declaration that FHWA is uh, pushing for uh, rightfully. Uh, the generalized understanding here for EPDs is that the focus is on the material production only. But the MAPDG, we think that the MAPDG analysis can be integrated into the current product category rules um, to include also the face life of the of the material and finally um, I would like to also to acknowledge a, a big, uh, a significant, in my opinion, uh, limit uh, of our research, which is that mineral replacement is, of the of the HMA is not the only um, maintenance or rehabilitation technique that we have, and more research is needed needed in this regard. Um, I'm thinking, for example, about the use of the Aptaps method, uh, the the Aptaps. Uh, engine together with the HPMS data that are currently used uh, for uh, decision in the decision making uh, uh, at the decision making stages to uh, prioritize the work that must be done on the on the network and that include also different type of maintenance and, re and, and, um, and rehabilitation uh, techniques. Uh, with this, uh, I thank you all uh, for the attention. Here you have our uh, contacts. Uh, feel free to ask questions now or contact, uh, contact us later. Uh, Lorraine, back to you. Thank you so much.
I do not see. Oh, here we go. Thank you so much. Um, I do not see any questions or comments in the chat, um, but certainly we have a couple more minutes if anyone wants to unmute themselves or oh, I see a raised hand now from Eob. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good morning, Lauren. Good morning, Michele, Angela, and you, uh, Heider. Very nice presentation. I, I have one question. Um, first, uh, if you allow me, I was, I'll try to start by bragging about Mindat. At the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that the APDG and then other came up like MIMPEV. I think MIMPEV, if I'm not wrong, was uh, created actually before the APDG by David Newcomb in the 90s, in the late 1995 or 99. So I just wanted to brag about Mindat. But the second, I want to, to understand. So basically, today you are showing us a roadmap or a methodology that can be used to evaluate any green technology. Today you talked about rubber, but in general, is basically you put it there and then basically you customize it based on what technology you want. In the case of Angela, for example, she used the distress right quality in the in dry in the dry area. They use ratting. So I am, is that correct understanding? So basically, this is a, a big well, model for analyzing different things, not necessarily yeah, only rubber. Absolutely, absolutely. No, you're, you're right, you have, uh, you're right for uh, two things. One, for bringing about uh, uh, Minpe. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and also, yes, we are indeed um, uh, picturing here a, a roadmap, as you said, or a methodology. Uh, this can be used uh, not only for green solutions, but also for current solutions. PMB is uh, currently used uh, everywhere. And uh, if you develop an, an, an EPD for um, uh, SBS modified asphalt and you compare with the APD uh, for an asphalt with neat bitumen, if you consider only the uh, materials production stage, the uh, HMA with SBS is going to be penalized because it's going to have mm -hmm. higher impact anyway. You need to produce the SBS, you need to mix with the bitumen, and you need to work at higher temperature. So the material is going to be penalized. But uh, mm -hmm. are we still, uh, I mean, the, the point here is that we, we, we cannot say that that material must be penalized because the longevity, a word that I've heard uh, many times in the last few days, the longevity of that material Material is uh, longer than uh, or expected longer than um, the, uh, the, the the service life of the HMA with net bitumen. So why should we penalize that material in the EPDs? Uh, and mm -hmm. um, as you said, yes, indeed, uh, Angela used um, a, a certain. Uh, the IRI basically to uh, decide how many um, uh, reconstruction cycles to include in the analysis while Haider looked at the uh, rutting and fatigue cracking. At the end of the day, I think uh, um, uh, I, I think you need to go with uh, what is your leading distress for that specific payment structure. Mm -hmm. And uh, if your leading distress is fatigue cracking, that it means that you need to reconstruct the uh, the top layer or you need to do something because you have fatigue cracking. If rideability is a concern for you as it was for Angela, then you go with the, uh, the IRI values. So my question with that is, in order to do this, you need always to have a control, which is what uh, actually the DOT is currently using. That is your basic metric of measurement, the baseline. It's a uh, it's not going to be basically okay. These are all, all options available, and these are so you always basic at the end of the day you're saying okay based on what you're doing now currently, this is what you can gain or lose. Well, that's the way we we advance, right? You are uh, you're doing something right now, but somebody comes out with a different idea saying that you can do better, but you can okay. do better only if you compare with what you're doing right now, right? Okay. Yes. Yes. So one thing we 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 struggled was, for example, with life cycle cost analysis. In our case, maybe you can come up with a good option using, but for example, asphalt bitumen. But then someone would say, okay, why can I use concrete? You know. So in that sense, this model is basically 
asking the DOT first to specify what they are going to use now, and then based on that. Yeah, okay. but uh, keep in mind that the MAPDG is not only limited to flexible payment, right? So you mm -hmm. can actually compare different uh, scenarios. One is flexible and the other one is rigid. What is more convenient from a longevity point of view, but also from the environmental impact from the point of view, uh, if you want uh, these two scenarios uh, to be to be compared. OK, thank you very much, Paul. Thank yeah, you. Great thanks. presentation. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Lorraine, I don't know if we still have uh, time. Um, uh, there are a couple of, of questions in the chat. You you tell oh, me yes. if we can okay. respond otherwise. Uh, uh, yeah, I think we'll go ahead and, and uh, respond to those and we'll go over a couple more minutes and if people have to leave, they can, sure. um, but we'll just capture these questions. And answers. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Angela, one question mm -hmm. is for you, but I'm gonna yes. respond to the other question, which is okay. from uh, Dr. Yu. Uh, uh, hi, Dr. Yu. Um, um, the uh, the confidence we have used uh, the uh, ME design to predict the the material. So the question is, uh, my, uh, the confidence you have to use ME design to predict the materials you have used. Um, well, actually, uh, we are lucky because um, um, the um, uh, in both in the uh, in Michigan and in the UAE uh, the uh, models. Uh, of the MAPDG are calibrated to uh, the local conditions, but uh, this is something that uh, many states are doing right now or have done in the past, so they can actually use um, um, uh, calibrated models for, for they, their state. And um, uh, if the models are, are calibrated, then it means that the prediction of the distresses over time has been of Optimized at a certain level. Uh, we all know that prediction always comes with uh, some, um, you know, question mark and drawback. But the MAPDG today is the best. Um, tool we have for these kind of predictions. At the network level, as I presented in the last slides, uh, if we use the um, HPMS data and the APTAPS engine, we are actually able to perform a prior calibration of these models for the area of interest. And this is actually what we, um, uh, some of the uh, colleagues here at MSU are working on. And um, uh, the life cycle assessment concept can be integrated into these models later on. Uh, I hope I, I responded to your question, uh, Angela. Uh, for you, mm -hmm. there is a question uh, yeah. on why you decided a period mm -hmm. of 50 years as a functional unit. So I use 50 years for the service life and I use the 20 years for the design life because this is a common practice in uh, in Michigan. And yeah, I believe with the shorter period, I would have less number of the reconstruction over time. Uh, however, I think the, the trend would be the, the same anyway. Yeah. All right, uh, Lorin, I think we responded to uh, both questions in the in the chat. Uh, yeah. So okay. Back to you. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I think we will wrap up for today. Uh, we went over just a few minutes, but we held on to quite a few people here. So uh, I will say thank you to our speakers. Thank you to our audience for attending today, and uh, we will see you next month. Um, which will be on December 19th. And uh, we hope everyone has uh, a happy Thanksgiving if you celebrate. Um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Have a Thank nice you. day and Bye. happy Thanksgiving. Bye. Bye-bye.